Good morning, church. Such a pleasure it is for us to be in the house of the Lord. And we anticipate it all week a great moment of worship today. And we're here with one purpose to return praise unto God. So as we channel our minds and our hearts heavenwards, let us just take a moment to clear our atmosphere of all the things that are not necessary for this time. As we're here to worship, let us worship with an open heart, an open mind, knowing that we worship a God who is alive, a God who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all things. Above all that we can ask for, he is a God of possibilities. And everything that we desire today, let's lay it at the throne. Lay it at the altar. Let us give it into the hands of our creator, our daddy. The one who called into being out of nothing. He called life. He called creation and he established and even so this today we serve this God so as we approach the throne of grace I just want to invite you to stand with me as we just lift up the name of Jesus he is indeed our God he is indeed our refuge he is our strong tower when we run into him we are saved there's no other name given among men by which we can be saved this morning but the name of Jesus, our Redeemer, our sacrificial Lamb. And Father, we bless you. We thank you for Jesus. Because had it not been for your intervention, where would we be? And so Lord God, under the throne of grace, we come before you humbly, Lord, and just lay everything before you. Father, we subject our will. We subject, Lord God, our intentions, our plans, our future. We just subject everything, Lord, right now to your will. And Father, we just say this morning, let your hands cover us. Let your hands, Lord God, be upon us. Let your hands be over us Lord God in your hands Lord God and under your covering Lord we subject ourselves Father I declare today that no weapon that form against us would prosper and Father every tongue that rise up in judgment will be condemned Father I charter this charge this atmosphere Lord God for great things and Father as you, your spirit Lord would have preeminence over the realms I declare, Lord God, no hindrances. When your word go forth this morning, it shall go forth with purpose and power. Let it accomplish that which it set out to accomplish. Let the minds and hearts of the people be receptive. Father, no hindrances right now in the name of Jesus. And let your flow go forth in Jesus' name. Amen. And so we remain in the atmosphere of worship. And I'd just like to invite our worship ministers to lead us in worship this morning. For the Lord is great and is greatly to be praised. This morning, if you know that our God is great, just lift those hands to him and just worship him this morning. Lord, we worship him. He's got the power to heal, deliver, because he is a great God. Thank you, Jesus. Into 
into the darkness you shine Out of the ashes we rise There's no one like you Nobody like you, Jesus None like you Our God is Our God is greater Our God is stronger your hands and say to him, come on, say, our God is greater, our God is greater, we serve our a strong God, God is stronger, Lord you, Lord you are higher than day, lift him high, Father, our God is healer, so awesome in power, so our God, our God, our God. Cause you reign above all And so we say Into the darkness you shine Into the darkness we shine Out of the ashes Out of the ashes we rise Come on, somebody There's no one, no one like you I came to let heaven know that no one like Let's you Lift your voice and say into the darkness Into the darkness we shine Somebody gotta shine this morning And rise from the ashes Out of the ashes oh, we rise no one There's no Jesus. one like you I am searched to heaven time No one like you like Jesus. Nobody like my God Our God Our God is greater Yes he our God is stronger, Lord, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Open the eyes.
to say to him none like you say it again what are you turn what are you turn what are you turn to praise this morning because he is indeed worthy of our praises hallelujah he's worthy he's worthy he's worthy to be praised amen hallelujah, hallelujah. the bible says in psalms 18 that i will call upon the lord for he is worthy to be praised amen I will call upon the Lord for he is worthy to be praised and the theme for today is Lord over my life and this song simply says that I am declaring that he is Lord over my life I need you to declare today that he is Lord over your life because he's the only one who we can call upon amen oh, oh. Oh, shall I be saved from my enemies? 
Day, okay, so we this is just deliverance. Make room, make way. This is deliverance. Somebody came in here needing a deliverance. It might not be flamboyant, it might not be a lot of noise and shouting. It's just going to be deliverance today. It's just gonna be victory. You're gonna be proclaiming a victory today. Moses answered the people, Do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see 
the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians, the Egyptians you see today, all right? You'll see them no more, all right? The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. You should just stop right there. Go down to verse 23. Go down to verse 23. So, the Egyptians now pursued them and all of Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen followed them into the sea. But during the last watch of the night, the Lord looked down in a pillar of fire and cloud at the Egyptian army and threw it into confusion. Now go to chapter 17. Let's go to chapter 17 when this is all over. Exodus and chapter 17 and just one verse. Verse 15. And the word of God in verse 15 reads thus. As Moses built an altar and he called it, the Lord is my banner. Yahweh is my Nisi. He said because hands were lifted up. Hands were lifted up against the throne of the Lord. The Lord will be at war against the Amalekites, whomever they may be, from generation to generation. God over my life. Israel had been a people of destiny. Called by God, chosen by God, loved by God, and knew where they were going. They were, they, they, they left on God's journey real fine. They were happy. They were buoyant and exhilarated. They sensed the very presence of God with them, Israel's people, people of destiny. So at the very onset of that journey, out of where they were to where God had called them to be. There was just this euphoria, as it were, of being with God. Let me tell you something. There comes a point in journeying with God that things seem to shift. Things seem to change. And where the Israelites, and I'm just setting the pace for what is to come, where the Israelites are at this juncture, it's not a good place. When the story begins to unfold in Exodus 14, God had given them the word, turn back and camp. So they turned back and they set up camp. But while they had set up camp, if you read earlier in Exodus 14, while they had set up camp, Pharaoh called his generals together 
You have to understand spiritual warfare like I started telling. Let me get rid of this because I want to. You have to understand spiritual warfare like I was telling you last week. It is not incidental. It is not happenstance. It is strategic and intentional against God's people. And so while they are listening, mind you, listening to the instruction of God and setting up. In the camp of the enemy, they are strategizing. And Pharaoh is saying, we are going after them. We will waste them in the desert. We will wipe them out. And there will be no more. It, that is his intention. If we can't enslave them, which is his primary goal, to bring them and enslave them. If we can't enslave them, they shall not go free. So he gets, as you read, he gets now his hordes with him of chariots and chariots of chariots and take out after them. It is a threatening sight to see them coming. And as the Israelites, the Hebrew people look and see this, they lose heart and begin to complain to Moses. The situation then is not unlike our own spiritual battles. We are under sometimes in a delusional manner we are under the impression that somehow there will not be a fight. Three things, three things, and then I'll be done, okay? Because we have to get some deliverance going here. So the first thing that I want to say this morning is this to all of you, um, not just members of the church, but people of God. Your mother, your father, husband, your wife, your church member. First thing that you need to do is to Let's take a little look at your situation. Huh? That's the first step in spirit, spiritual warfare and in, in, in deliverance. I'm trying to set this up for deliverance. I'm trying to set this up for deliverance. Take a little look at where you are. Analyze your situation. What's, going really, what's really going down? What's, what's really happening? Are you in a good place? Where the Israelites were, that was not a good place. I want you to get a sense of God's people. Behind them, to the north, behind them, were the mountains. So they can't run there. To the south, was the expanse of the sea. So they can't run there. To the east, there was a desert. So it's death if you go there. And coming in from Egypt, from the west, were Pharaoh's army. So as they analyzed where they were, it was not, by any stretch of the imagination, a good place. And there are times when we, we find ourselves in what we can best describe is not a good place. And the devil knows this. The devil knows this. It's a reality of human experience and it is also a reality of 
Christian experience that you will not always find yourself in a good place. So the question that you have to ask yourself is not only where you are, but the next question that comes fast on the heel of that, who led you there? How did you get there? Because if this is where God has led you, then it doesn't matter if there are mountains behind you and sea before you and desert on one side and the army on the other side. If God has led you there, if following God has brought you to where you are, it may look bad, but it is a good place. Setting this up. And so the first thing that you have to do is to understand that if God is with you, though the armies or the mountains or the oceans would seem to engulf you, if God is with you, if God is your banner, if God is over you, you shall be delivered. I think there are two people in here who believe that this morning. I have a, I have a deliverance shout in me I'm waiting to bring out this morning. Oh, I want to shout it out all now. Just trying a little platform for this shout. You have to know where you are and what's going on. And I know fully well, I know fully well that for every one of us under the sound of my voice, that it is not necessarily in a fortress right now. And that some may very well feel what the people of destiny felt. Totally vulnerable. Totally threatened. And very afraid. Not understanding how this is going to unfold. But the second thing that I have to say this morning, just three things I'm done. And then we move to deliverance. The second thing that I have to say this morning is that you've got to assess your spirit. Where the battle is, where the battle is, is about your spirit. Where the war is going on is for your spirit. You have to understand that. Spiritual warfare, don't be shocked by this rocket science piece of revelation. Spiritual warfare is about the spirit. It's all designed to kill your spirit. It's all designed to quench your spirit. It's all designed to bother your spirit. It is all designed to leave you flat. That's the warfare. The devil is very subtle. I'm not trying, I'm not trying to big up the devil. And I, I'm just trying to say what is, what is. The devil is very, very subtle. He is the master of deception. And in spiritual warfare against God's people, in spiritual warfare, he will take people of destiny and make them look like people of damnation. And when we see people of destiny beginning to look like people of damnation, our spirit, what happened to your spirit? You talk to people, you visit with them, you chat with them, they get down, they get discouraged, they get depressed, they feel dejected. Why? Because the devil is deceiving them and making destiny look like damnation. In the midst, my dear friends, in the midst of spiritual warfare, it is therefore upon us to be undaunted in our spirit. And you say, never on my watch are you going to deceive me. 
assess your spirit. Never for one day become daunted. Never for one day become dejected. Never for one day become depressed. Never for one day feel as if God is not with you. Never for one day get the sense of discouragement as if your bones are aching. Never for one day. For every time you lose heart, you give lie. You, you give lie. To what God has spoken into your life. That you are a man and a woman of destiny. Look what happened. Let me move on. Look what happened to the Israelites. So they saw mountains. <laughs> and they saw sea. And they saw desert. And they saw Pharaoh's army. And boy, they started crying. They started, now get this, they started blaming leadership. Moses, it is your fault. What kind of leadership is this, Moses? Why would you lead us from where we are? Why would you want to lead us to some promised land, Moses? Moses, you did not think through the logistic properly. Moses, you have left us vulnerable. They began to blame leadership. Sometimes in your family you begin to lead, blame the leadership. Sometimes in the church you begin to blame the leadership. Sometimes wherever you are you begin to blame others around you. You begin to look at one another and quarrel and fight and, and point fingers at each other. That is the devil winning the victory in the spiritual sphere. I tell you, not on my watch should that happen. Glory to God. Let's go. Not only did they start blaming, but what's something else that happened? What's something else that happened? Remember how they left Egypt singing and rejoicing and dancing? When the crux of the matter, when the real warfare hit them, somehow their song has gone. It is a sad thing when a people of song, when a people of singing, when a people of rejoicing lose their singing, lose their rejoicing, lose their dance, lose their zippity do that because things hard. It's the same Israelites that sang years later. How can we be expected to sing the Lord's song in a strange land? So they rejoice and turn to remorse. And in the midst of spiritual warfare, what happened? They became bitter. Their blessings that they came out of Egypt with uh, were forgotten and bitterness took its place. I think what happens in the matter of spiritual warfare, my dear friends, in the strategy of spiritual warfare, there is indeed a war going on. There, as I said last week, it is not in the flesh and in blood, but it is against principalities, it is against power, and it is against spiritual wickedness in high places. There is a war going on. It is strategic, it is intentional, it is drawn up. They know where your high points are, they know where your weak points are, and they are testing you. Testing you in your income, testing you in your family, testing you in your finances, testing you in your health, testing you in your social relationship. Test after test after test after... Somebody say, Amen, I know what you're talking about, Pastor. Somebody knows what I'm talking about. And in the lie of the enemy, and in the face... Now get this. In the face of very real threats. Don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. In the face of very real threats, it is human to lose heart. That's what happens. It is human to lose heart. And often in the face of the devastation that seems to loom over us, in the face of the depth of what we are going through, it is often the human response to feel that there is damnation coming rather than focus on the destiny that we are called to. Somebody know what I'm talking about. So all that the Hebrew people could see is that they were in a bad position and all that they saw was the strength of the enemy. And furthermore, they knew that they were no match for the enemy. 
And the result of all of this, the result of all of this is that it sapped their spiritual strength. It sapped their reserve and it caused them to focus on, them, on themselves and their own weaknesses and their own exposure. Let me tell you something. There are a lot of us who are overexposed. There are a lot of us because of God's calling and because of God's leading that we put aside certain things, but it leaves us exposed financially. It leaves us exposed on a whole slew of things. It leaves us exposed. But it is for God. But when we feel that sense of vulnerability, and when we feel that the enemy has the upper hand, and like I said last week to prepare for this, when we feel as if the enemy has the ascendancy, there is something that happens in our human spirit. Now currently, Currently, because the enemy is the master of deception, currently, it may very well seem in your life that he is in the ascendancy. It may very well seem in your life that he is winning battles on every front. And trust me, had it not been for the Lord and had it not been for faith in God and has it not, had it not been for trust in God, I myself would have declared, oh, but he is victorious. And one guy that I converse with, and we talk a lot of stuff, um, he, he's not really a Christian. He said to me, Pastor, why don't you just give up? That's what he said. Pastor, don't you see that you're wasting time? You're wasting time. Things are not going to change. People are going to be who they are. Sin is always going to be rampant. Lives are always going to be destroyed. Pastor, you are not making a difference. Give up. I was told that two weeks ago. I was told that because the normal human inclination is towards that which is natural. Get me, get me, get me. Natural. To run towards sin. Get me? That's, that's a natural human inclination. And it seems that preach as you would, talk as you would, do what you can. People are always seemingly going to be catapulting in the opposite direction. And so... In situation after situation, grouping after grouping, may the Holy Spirit speak to you in this, company after company, individual after individual, it seems, now watch you, it seems as if when you analyze what is happening, the devil is winning. This thing is a mess. The devil, it seems, has the ascendancy. People, therefore, in that milieu lose their singing. People lose their prayers. People lose their hallelujah. People lose their voice. People lose their sing. People lose their edge. People lose their credibility. People lose their testimony. People lose, 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 lose. It seems all the time because it seems over and over that the devil is winning. That is the deception. So you analyze your situation. And you assess your spirit. But there's one third thing that we have to say. And then we move into a time of deliverance. The third thing that you need to do is you have to adjust your sight. You must adjust, you must adjust your sight. What are you seeing? For the Israelites, all that they could see was the adversary. That's all they could see. And sometimes, my dear friend, those of you who are battling and have been battling for a long time, those of you who are fighting external issues and those of you who are fighting personal struggles, those of you who are fighting external issues and those of you who are fighting personal battles, 
The battle can seem lost by every appearance. When you look at what is stacked up against you, the mountains and the sea. When you look at the desert and when you look at the army. When you see chariots and when you see horsemen. And when you see officials. And when you see a uniformed army. And when it seems as if it's getting closer every single second. You lose heart. Everything, when you look around you, everything can make you lose heart. That is the way it is designed. That is the way it is designed. That is spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare is not manifesting demons with wings and horns and fangs with pitchfork. Spiritual warfare comes in the morning when you wake up. It means the most innocuous of things. It comes when you're trying to raise your son, your teenage daughter. The verbal battles there. You feel like you want to choke the life out of somebody. It's just warfare. Spiritual warfare hits you even before you leave your very own home. Spiritual warfare hits you in your relationships. Spiritual warfare is not about demons and dungeons. Spiritual warfare is about real people in your life. Spiritual warfare is about your home. Spiritual warfare is about your security. Spiritual warfare is about your assets. Spiritual warfare is when you come out of your home and you're driving down the street and some, for some, no good reason, something just ticks you off. The spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare exists in the milieu of your relationship. Spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare is a very real and present thing. Spiritual warfare. The devil is a master of deception. Spiritual warfare comes to it comes through very seemingly innocent and innocuous things that happen in the office as spiritual warfare, trying to diminish your spirituality and trying to destroy your testimony. It is spiritual warfare. It is a very concentrated and it's a very strategic attack. Spiritual warfare. If you as a person of destiny can be laid waste, if you as a person of destiny can be laid bare by the enemy, he would have gained in spiritual warfare. And when you look around, and when you look around, it seems as if at every turn, as, as if at every turn, there was some struggle. The struggle is real, someone said. But in spiritual warfare and for us to understand and for us to begin to comprehend the great victory that is ours, we ought not to look around. But help me church, we ought to look up. One songwriter says, lift up your head for redemption, dry it nigh. You see, while the Israelites were looking at the mountains and looking at the desert and looking at the sea and looking at Pharaoh's army, had they looked up, they would have seen that God was already gathering over them. I'm telling you, they would have declared like the songwriter, God over my life. There's a, there, there, there is a deliverance, people have to understand. There's a deliverance that is God's for his people. There is a deliverance. 
I am not going to stand here and deny that there will not be intense moments when you feel threatened, when you feel vulnerable, when you feel at risk, when, when things, when the bottom seems to just about begin to fall out from under you. I am not going to declare that. But I am going to stand here today as we come to deliverance. I am going to stand here today and boldly and confidently say that in every battle that you battle, led by the Lord, that victory is yours. Every battle, victory is yours. Through every trial, victory is yours, a child of God. Through every opposition, victory is yours. Through every hardship, victory is yours. Through every struggle, deliverance is yours. These are not idle words. These are the very promises declared by God for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Victory is yours. When this was all true, and Moses began to comprehend what just took place. There was no other thing that he could have said. But what he said in verse 17. God over my life. Nisi, my banner, hangs over me. There is, my dear friends, a banner over the lives of God's people. There is indeed, my dear friends, a standard that is set above us. We are in God's army and God never sends his army out without that insignia, without that standard, without that banner. And as long as God is over our lives, no Pharaoh, no Amalekite, no Vincentian. Can I say that real quick? No weapon. No opposition. No insidious evil can have even the slightest iota of victory over you if God is over your life. Some tremble and quake in fear because of the reality of their struggle. Y'all just be patient with me a little bit. I have to get this out. I have to get it out. Okay, just be patient. Sometimes we don't get it. Sometimes we don't understand it. Sometimes we, we ask ourselves, why? Why? Why me? And sometimes we really don't know what is going on. We really, my dear friends, we have, sometimes we don't sit, we have little understanding of the magnitude of the spiritual attack that is designed for you. You. And sometimes in the portals and halls that we can't see you are called by name. You think it easy? God help me. 
You are called by name. You are named. This is not mumbo jumbo. I am talking here. When things you start to go haywire and no matter how you try, you try, you try. It is because you have been singled out and you have been called by name and it is your turn to go to hell. It is as if, okay, we're going out. And I mean, the, the, the resources that are available in the spiritual realm to unseat you is unimaginable. This is a big matter and you have to get it. Spiritual warfare, you have to get it. When, when, when the enemy and the diabolical one understands and come, begins to comprehend your destiny, where God is leading you, where he's setting you up, where he's taking you out of the Egypt that you used to be in and he's putting you on a path to the promised land. It aggravates him to see the love of God showered upon you and he gets in the way. I am telling you, it is the enemy's calls you by name, calls your son by name, calls your husband by name, calls your daughter by name, calls your wife by name, calls your friend by name and he say, I'm going after all of them. Spiritual warfare, get this. Get this. Not mumbo jumbo. And so one man who was destined, one man who was destined in the absence of Christ to become the leader of the church and incredibly pivotal position of destiny. When the devil realized how Christ was setting up Peter to use him to influence generations, when the devil realized the magnitude of what this man stood for, one thing came in his mind, I'm going to destroy that man. And in the dark halls where these secret coalitions are made, he made this vow are going after Peter. But God, who sees into all of these things, knew that he had called Peter, come on somebody say, by name. And he said, but you can't touch. Let me tell you something. Touch not the Lord's anointed. You can't touch. If God said don't touch, you can't touch. If God said don't touch, you can't touch. So even when he wanted to waste that boy, he had to go to God and say, I could do this. <laughs> I could do this. You had to ask permission. Yeah. And, and so Peter not understanding this and Christ wanting to reassure Peter say, Peter, the devil called your name. Peter, the, somebody ought to understand that the devil has called your name. The devil has called your name. And he says, Peter, he wants, let me tell you something church. Peter, he wants to sift you like wheat. I don't know if you understand the sifting of wheat, but when you sift, and when you sift, and that wind comes and blows, it's all God. Peter, the devil wants to waste you. It is the enemy's plan to call people by name and waste them. It is the enemy's plan, like he went up, Hasatan, Hasatan went in with his bold face self. Hasatan went... Hasatan went into the very pre Satan went into the very presence of God and said, "You see, Job, he's serving you, but I could mess him up. Oh God! You see that servant Job, he is serving well, but if you give me a chance, I will pull the rug from under his feet. I will mess with that boy, and when I'm finished with him, he won't be serving you anymore." So God said, "You're bad," which is true. God said, you're bad. Go ahead and let's see if what, what will happen. So in the process, you hear me and you hear me well, how spiritual warfare looks. Spiritual warfare is not ugly demons in the night. Let me show you how spiritual warfare looks. In that spiritual warfare, which was not between the enemy and, 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 and Job. It was not. It was between God and, and Satan. <laughs> it was between them. <laughs> And the only reason why the devil was licking up on Job 
It's because God loved Job. It's because God made promises towards Job. It's because of God, Job's relationship with God. But the matter was between God and Satan. Job was in the mix. So he said, give me that boy. Watch me now. And when the spiritual warfare came, it was not pitchfork. It was not darkness. It was not suit. It was not witches and mumbo jumbo. When the spiritual warfare came, it was his cattle. When the spiritual warfare came, it was his oxen, your, your car. When the spiritual warfare came, it was his family. When the spiritual warfare came, it was his son, it was his daughter. When the spiritual warfare came, it was the boils, it was his head. That is health. That is spiritual warfare. Peter's name was called. Job's name was called. Make no mistake. It is not that you are so important except that you are important to God. That your name will be called. Your name is being called because you matter to God. Your name is being called because you matter to God. Your name is being called. You matter to God. But Job said this. Even though you slay me, I will still trust in him. Somebody say, God, over my life. Wrapping this up, wrapping this up. Deliverance. We, we have to understand that there is a victory out there. That no child of God, no man of God, no woman of God needs to understand this concept of de de defeat. When we have the very real assurance of victory. We should not sing songs of defeat. We should not have attitudes of defeat. We should not have demeanors of defeat. We should not have a face of defeat. Because we are children of victory. God, if you believe it, God over your life. Wrapping it up. God over your life. So Peter was called by name. Job was called by name. I'm going to give you one more name. And that name is Jesus. Once when the disciples, I'm wrapping this up so don't worry. Once when the disciples set out. When the disciples set out at sea on the Sea of Galilee. And the master was with them. A tempest, a storm came up on the sea. And it battered that ship. And it shook that ship. And the, the record is like they were about to be drowned. That's what it was. And in the midst of it, Christ was asleep. And so the songwriter who penned that most beautiful song, I wish you knew it, penned this beautiful song, they went to him and said, Master, carest not thou that we perish? How canst thou love how canst, thou, how canst thou lie asleep when each moment so madly is threatening a grave in the angry deep? And then the master just got up and he said, oh Boy, I wish you knew the song. Peace, be still. Peace, be still. Peace, peace, be still. The wind and the waves. Shall obey thy will. Somebody sing. Peace be still. Well, of the storm cast sea or demons. Whatever. No. Woo! Swallow the ship where well lies the master of ocean. Earth and size, because I tell you this, they all obey thy will. When God says peace, 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 